Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the University of Pittsburgh European Studies Center's Conversations on Europe. Today's conversation topic is Transgender Europe and we've invited a full panel of experts on this subject to give their um, impressions and their opinions. Um, this is a part of a series, Conversations on Europe, which we do monthly uh, and it is funded in part by the U.S. Department of Education and the European Union through our Jean Monnet Center of Excellence grant and through our Title VI National Resource Center grant. Um, but of course, the ideas and opinions reflected herein are not the opinions of the US government or the European Union. I have to put in that disclaimer. Um, all of this will be archived on uh, YouTube and available for viewing off of our webpage. Um, that's the European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. So please remember that this is being recorded. Uh, we are proud this session to be partnering with our friends and colleagues at the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies program here at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, we have, we're delighted that um, the director of that program has agreed to moderate. So I am going to turn it over to him, uh, Dr. Todd Reeser, a professor in the French and Italian Languages and Literatures Department, as well as the Director of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Program. And um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. OK, great. Uh, so I want to just ask our uh, three panelists if you could start by briefly introducing yourself, uh, if you could tell us uh, your name, uh, a little bit about your background, and then if there's anything else you'd like us to know, uh, that anything that we need to know for the next uh, 60 or 90 minutes. Uh, so Matt, can we start with you? Yes. Hi. So my name is Matt Fournier. I'm an assistant professor of French at Ithaca College in upstate New York. Uh, I'm also a French citizen, but I've been living in the U.S. since, I think, seven, eight years. And I'm a female, female transgender, but I started my transition in the U.S., which I think uh, has some consequences we will discuss. Uh, I'm, and my research focuses on transgender studies, and I'm working mostly on European literature for from the beginning of or the first part of the 20th century. But I'm also, of course, interested in uh, contemporary cultural productions. Great, thank you. Uh, Tomasz. Hello, my name is Tomasz Jules Futi. I graduated in gender studies with a dissertation in, on trans studies on normative and intersectional violence against trans people in times of biopolitics. So my focus is on intersectional violence and normative violence, meaning state violence. And um, yeah, from a political perspective, I studied um, international political science before, worked at the gender studies department in Berlin, and at the moment work at a queer LGBTIQ organization working against intersectional discrimination and for a more inclusive health system. Great, thank you. And Thomas. So hello everybody, my name is Thomas and I come from the country with unpronounceable name, which is Lithuania and is located in the northern east part of the European Union. And I work as a policy coordinator for human rights with the National LGBT Rights Organization here back home, which is the only civil society organization working exclusively on LGBT rights. Uh, and uh, transgender human rights has been a big part of my professional portfolio and the organization because unfortunately Lithuania remains the only of the few countries in Europe with no de facto or legal recognition or medical gender reassignment procedures. So we are act actively working in this field of, of trying to create an establishment procedure. And of course, our ultimate goal is going from zero to hero. So I hope that this conversation is going to contribute to that aspiration, and I'm really looking forward to this exchange of ideas. Great. Thanks to the three of you for uh, coming, and uh, welcome to everyone who's here. So I want to kind of ask two groups of questions. The first group of questions that I want to ask is really sort of about the nation and the nation state, and especially the nation state uh, which with, with which the three of you uh, are most familiar. Uh, and then secondly, later on, I want to talk sort of about the Europeness of the question, since it's uh, a European Union center that's kind of hosting uh, this discussion. So uh, 
i'd like to start by asking you if you could talk about the national context in which you you work both in an academic sense or in an activist or personal sense and i'd like you to talk about trans rights. so i'm interested in in hearing ah sort of what the nation state does vis-a-vis transgender in your case. and i'm particularly thinking about the medical context ah the legal context ah violence with respect to the nation state. so let's um start matt with you with me yes okay so i'm french ah and france has a very strong ah identity as far as nation state is concerned so um and it makes i would say in general transgender lives very difficult because in order to um in order to change our legal gender id and our legal names um we have to go through two different difficult processes uh so in order to change your legal gender you basically have to go to court against the state because the french notion of identity is very different from the one uh, you have in the us basically your identity is not about you it's about um identification paper and your identity belongs to the state so in my case i was declared female at birth and if i wanted to uh, appear as male on on my passport uh, ids etc i would have to go to trial against the state claiming that they are lying and i'm not female i'm male and in order to do that until a few months ago in order to win a case at court uh, until a few months ago we had to be basically sterilized meaning um castration for uh, female to male individuals and hysterectomy uh from um no that's your way around <laughs> in, in any case uh extensive surgery that would not only need to be performed but proven by and checked on by um state appointed doctors so for instance if i were to give a, a report from a surgeon this wouldn't be enough i would still have to be um, examined by legal legal experts now the those uh, extensive surgeries aren't required anymore uh, since a law that was passed um that became was passed in may i think but became actual uh, at the end of uh, the year uh, 16. now we still have to go to court and the terms of the law i have them here are quite vague so the the um, we would need to demonstrate through a sufficient gathering of facts that um, we are basically gender incongruent, which leaves us to the good judgment of judges and courts. And we're not talking about um, more local courts. We're talking about tribunal de grande instance, which means exactly the same places where criminals are judged. And we're also talking about a lengthy process. So that's <laughs> and that's what the nation state is doing. And in terms of um, medical procedures, that's also very complicated because France has a very used to have a great healthcare system. So if you were to be diagnosed as a transgender, transsexual individual by the legal appointed doctors, then everything would be free. You would basically get any surgery free of charges almost you know but for not much money but those medical experts are mostly uh transphobic i don't know to say it's i if i'm being i'm generalizing here of course but this process is very difficult so you basically have to uh, find other doctors willing to help and there are a lot and to go through surgery uh paying out of pockets which is not as much uh, not exp not as expensive as in the us not even remotely as expensive but um it's still more difficult than what i can see in the us or in some um in uh, northern european countries 
because you never know what's going to happen to you. There are great surgeons, but then you have to go to a hospital procedure where the nurses aren't so educated. So I've got, I heard oral stories and, and well-ending stories as well. But uh, all in all, it's not, uh, it's not easy. Great, thank you. Thank you for uh, talking about that. Uh, Tomasz, uh, I assume right. you want to talk about the German context. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, yeah, to me, the, the question of like legal and medical norms are very important. Um, I also outlined this or highlighted this in my dissertation because they very much regulate the lives of many, if not almost all, trans people. What Matt already said, like um, the legal change of name and um, the gender marker, also in Germany is like. A, um, mixture of like a juridical process but also a psychiatric one and this is like something which is right now under vision but um, yeah since the 1980s trans people in Germany can change their name and gender marker like only in a binary system um, but the major point is that it's like gender identity is psychopathologized, so um, people need to get two psychiatric statements of like, tran like from the ICD-10 transsexualism, the diagnosis F64, which is a mental, um, yeah, a mental disease or considered like a mental diagnosis. And this process is like for many people um, pretty abusive because like the psychiatrists were affirmed by the court, like as studies now in the recent years showed like um, people face like really serious human rights violations. Some people have to undress in this psychiatric, not physical examinations. Um, it's like clearly binary gender norms are reproduced. And also many people suffer from the severe, severe stress going um, through these processes because in the end somebody judges on your name and your identity. And on top, like the legal process for many people is also not accessible. Like for many migrants not, refugees, minors, um, also people with disabilities. So if people have like um, psychiatric records, it's very difficult to pass these tests and they're like, you can see them as identity tests. And um, so there is a way to, to change name and gender marker, but it's not accessible for everyone. And it is like, yeah, it has like violent consequences or it's like a state institutionalized system of violence which is right now under revision, um, but we don't know yet the outcome. So there are expert opinions who clearly argue to abolish the psychiatric tests to allow um, like legal change based on the recent law changes which started in 2012 in Argentina and then on like internationally were like a groundbreaking moment where like the lobbying and law change changed fundamentally because Argentina proved that uh, name and gender market change can be as a like, simple bureaucratic process, which is based on self identification and testimony, and also that healthcare can be provided without a psychiatric diagnosis. So, um, from then on, also many European countries, starting with Malta, Norway, um, France luckily also changed recently um, and yeah, like some other countries made law change possible. So there's also the hope it's going to happen in Germany. But as we also have upcoming elections, it's unclear what comes out of that, but there are signs that it can change. And like, uh, because you post the two questions also about the medical system, so the, the systems in Germany are separated, like the medical system is connected with the health insurances, but the both systems reproduce each other in, in some other ways. So um, the health insurances often want like this um, psychiatric statements um, when you apply for surgery, even though the health insurances are not allowed to ask for them. But like all this, um, yeah, the pathologization is also like reflected in the law and it's definitely in the health insurance. 
So health insurances cover often um, hormone therapy, but um, like to get surgeries, people often have to make law cases. So you have to have one and a half years um, obligatory therapy, no matter if people want them or not. Um, and there has to be several other tests and requirements and also not all people can or what want to take hormones but they have to so like there are possibilities and for some people like surgeries are covered but also definitely not for all which also results that some people um, who have some economic resources and cannot battle with the health insurances for years decide to pay if they can the surgeries on their own um yeah and this system like is also so right now i'm participating in roundtables with also state officials and um med medical practitioners and uh, legal experts so when the icd-11 like from the international classification of diseases um, the new diagnosis will be released which is like clear now that trans will not be considered a mental disorder anymore but will be dealt in the section of uh sexual uh, conditions related to sexual health sorry <laughs> to reframe it um so like that um, hormone replacement uh therapy and also surgeries can still be covered but not under psychiatric diagnosis anymore so this um when it's implemented in germany will be um a great benefit but also there the battle with the health insurance will continue because right now they try to get out even though they can't because it's clear that they have to have cover trans health care also in the future. So this is the basic framework. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let's continue to move east. Uh, Thomas. So my country does not only have an interesting name, it also has a very interesting legal framework regarding the transgender human rights. Um, very interestingly, in 2001, the new very progressive civil code entered, entered into force, and the civil code has a specific article dedicated to gender reassignment, and that article in the civil code says that a person has a right to undergo for gender reassignment, and the second part of that article says that there should be a separate law regulating the order of the procedure of a gender reassignment. 16 years have passed since the adoption of the civil code, and surprise, surprise, there is still no law in practice. So generally speaking, the medical aspect of the gender reassignment procedure is not available within the framework of the Lithuanian healthcare system, and as a consequence, there is no possibility of obtaining uh, legal gender recognition. The only way is doing the medical procedure abroad somewhere else, and then coming back and suing the state before the national courts asking to change the identity documents. A uh, very interesting development that we had was in, was in 2007, when a transgender man, his name was Linus, he sued the Lithuanian government before the European Court of Human Rights. And his claim was very simple. He basically said to the European Court of Human Rights, he said, look, I have this right in the civil code that I can go for gender reassignment, but, however, I have no effective means of implementing my right in practice at the national level. And, of course, he won the case where the Ukrainian government uh, was found in violation of the Convention of European Human Rights. And then the court, the Strasbourg court, did a very interesting thing, which it usually doesn't do. It said to the Lithuanian government, you either adopt the law on gender reassignment three months after the judgment becomes final, or you pay 40,000 of pecuniary, 40,000 euros of pecuniary damages to the applicant, that had that he could travel abroad and do the gender reassignment procedure in the other jurisdiction. You can try to guess what our government did. Of course, they paid the money. Uh, and surprise, surprise, the problem did not disappear because there are more transgender people in the country than, than just this individual. So the process still continues. Um, uh, Almost eight years have passed since the judgment has been uh, in force, and there's still no effective legislation on the procedure in place. So we have been working very actively with the Council of Europe, which is, of course, the European institution, and maybe we can talk later on what role they, the concept of Europe plays in promoting transgender human rights on the national level. 
But we have managed to achieve that the execution of this European Court of Human Rights case was transferred to the enhanced supervision procedure. In human language, it means um, that now the Lithuanian government has to report to the Council of Europe every six months how it is going, how is it going with implementing this judgment, meaning adopting this legislation in practice. Uh, the reporting is very funny because when nothing is happens and you still have to write something, it's very funny to read those submissions. But also this advocacy opportunity provides for a very, very powerful tool for lobbying for certain change uh, on the national level. And I'm also very interested in this part about the nation state, because uh, I think this plays a huge, huge role in our national context in terms of promoting not only transgender, but also LGBT human rights. Uh, because, you know, we are quite a fresh new member of the European Union. We entered in 2004. And it was very, very interesting to observe that before 2004, we were such a nice, gay-loving country. No legislation was a problem. We passed the Equal Opportunities legislation, discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation prohibited, this progressive article in the Civil Code regarding uh, transgender human rights. And then we, in 2004, we got into this nice uh, club of rich, uh, fluffy countries. It took us some years to understand that nobody's checking anymore. And then all the stuff started happening. So I think, uh, and in terms to explain why, you know, because uh, Lithuanian identity, the national identity for the last two decades was very firmly constructed on, on the concept of coming back to Europe. That we, that we left the Soviet Union and when we want to come back to the family of the Western European nations. And when this goal was accomplished, there was a huge, huge disbalance regarding the national identity, because nobody could answer the question, what's, what's happening next? And unfortunately, I have to admit that now our national identity is being constructed on being a socially conservative society within the broader family of European nations. Mm -hmm. And I think that very negatively impacts the not only transgender human rights, but also LGBT, LGBT human rights as a more, more broader umbrella concept. Great, thank you. That's uh, extremely interesting and sort of counterintuitive perhaps to, to some of us that don't know the Lithuanian context. Um, I want to ask you also, the three of you, um, about uh, kind of representation, right? Um, and if you could talk, I realize this is a broad question, but if you could sort of talk about what kind of cultural circulation uh, takes place uh, with respect to transgender. So film, could be journalism, could be tabloid journalism, uh, documentary, literature, uh, et cetera. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on um, sort of national representation. Uh, Matt, in a way, this question is crafted for you because you work on questions of representation uh, much more than the, the two other uh, panelists. So uh, I'll go. I'll go to you. Okay. Let's talk about the Fr French context. So there are the ways to summarize very quickly. There are two um, different trends. One comes from the late '90s and is um, about cultural production that are queer identified. Queer um, is obviously, comes obviously from the American background, but it has been recuperated in a way in France to designate things that weren't um, gender binarists and that were also uh, a bit radical. So at starting at the end of the 90s, people started to, a minority of course, but people started to identify as queer and and so it's as, as a way to change things and change mentality because compared to the um, to the US, France, Fran France was a bit, um, I was completely unaware of gender and, social, and sexuality issues, orientation, identities, and so on. And so um, the answer was that during the late 90s, uh, people started to get very uh, radical on that. And um, so there was and still is a, a wave of very interesting um, cultural production, novels, uh, movies, movie documentaries, um, porn movies as well, uh, also um, performances and uh, by also people who uh, deem this, themselves as sexual educators and some 
just for fun, um, music bands, for instance. So and this um, so this was it's um, it's I would say it's almost over now and not as lively because um, well know the questions of uh, queer trans um, LGBTs in general are, are more uh, known from the public so um, and maybe we'll discuss this later but we had also a huge national fight against gay marriage in in 2012 so that also was part of um, uh, the, the public discussion. So this would be the first trend. And the second trend I was discussing is more, um, I would say, mainstream. So it's, and it's mostly um, TV shows, uh, TV documentaries, um, you know, let those late night shows where they have a trans guest and they explain how difficult their life is, uh, some sort of good intentions, but victimization. Um, and and then we also I, I just want to name a couple of um, two actually uh, movies. One is Tomboy from the movie director Cecil Tellin um, And Tomboy was I mean is a really good movie, and it's also interesting because it focuses on one uh, on a child, which makes it at first made it a bit less controversial because you could always say that it's a childish game and you know that the trans person in, in the movie will get over it and also the violence gets from the adult comes from the adults which are educators so after all you know maybe uh, they're just playing the part as parents so the, this movie was um quite popular and then it became a center uh, um, it became a centerpiece uh, in the controversy uh, around gay marriage and uh, gender education at school because, well, we see basically an eight, 12 year old uh, trans guy. And so there was actually, there were actually some petitions against showing these movies. No, it wasn't even a question to show this movie in, in um, even high schools, but having them. Uh, having copies in the uh, public libraries, for instance, or school libraries. And um, so that was the first movie I wanted to mention because I think it's it's an important one and a very good movie. And the other one is a um, movie documentary titled Bombi. And it's about um, uh, one of our uh, former, uh, so a trans woman who was a former cabaret star because she didn't have a choice as um, a trans woman in the 50s. And then she um, basically changed her life, found a new job as a, as a school um, uh, teacher. And she also had the chance of living very long. So she's still, uh, her real name is um, Marie-Claire Cruveau, and she's still a public figure uh, in terms of trans rights. She's also a trans icon because, well, if only because she has lived so long and talk so well about it. And um, I wanted to mention this movie documentary because it's, um, it shows that trans history in France goes a long way and it's not just about the 19th and, and just about current issues. And also this um, movie documentary has been made by um, a director called Sébastien Lichwitz who works on gender and sexuality issues and who has also quite a few good productions about that. That were Great, too many examples. Uh, Tomash. So um, I work less on representation, so I cannot answer so much. I think I, I yes. nevertheless can say that, like, I think in the recent years it changed slightly in Germany, like that. Um, sometimes you can see like uh, transgender youth or F to M, F to F in like a documentary. Um, there's also a few more like um, yeah books um, coming up. Uh, what I still miss a lot, like um, when I look, for example, um, yeah, English spoken series, like there's almost nothing in Germany where like 
I see trans people more like integrated in like movies or series um, where it's not like this documentary look. And I would also say there's like more and more like uh, um, action like, small video clips where people talk about themselves and their identity, especially young people, which are very important because I, for example, work like with teachers and also with school uh, school students and they very much learn by first of all like also on an emotional level like getting to know somebody and this person tells a story and they get a picture so this visual aspect of it and also realizing that yeah the person is also just a person and also has whatever life um, and it's not only trans so um, I see some things coming up there, which are partially state-sponsored, partially like um, out of the community DIY made. Um, there's also since a few years more like uh, um, black and of color, trans and uh, non-binary activism in Berlin. So I have to also say I'm not talking for all over Germany. I'm coming like from, or I'm living in Berlin. So when I work, for example, in, in southern Germany, it's like very different. And um, I think there are, more, like, there are cultural representations, definitely. Um, I think I personally still miss that like they're more, uh, I, I don't like the word normal, but that they are more like not only playing the trans person, but are just there. And I think this is what I, working with like, um, teachers and students realized that, for example, when, when some students of mine like saw the Fosters or whatever, ma many also US produced series which have whatever trans character, no matter if it's good or bad or orange is new black, that it changes things. So that's like, yeah, it becomes more normal to see trans people, see they have, they have also everyday life. Um, and it's not only this victim narrative or this pathologized narrative, but more like, okay, like, yeah, we are many things and every trans person is different. So I see more and more stuff coming up, but it still could be ways more. Great, thank you. Thomas, uh, Lithuanian context. So I think in Lithuania, we have a very interesting um, uh, circumstances regarding the fact that the legal aspects of uh, transgender human rights were developing much more before the social representation of social of transgender identities in the public sphere, and we got it. We had this legal case in 2007 already, and 2012 we started a very active civil society work on the implementation of the judgment, and then suddenly we realized that we were representing certain communities which was absolutely not visible and unheard. And we very suddenly realized that we, don't, we are not able to have any meaningful advocacy without having transgender people behind our backs and like knowing what they want and knowing what they need. So within the framework of our organization, we started very active uh, transgender community building activities involving both social and cultural aspects of gathering and representation. And I have to say that these efforts have been magnificently successful. Now we have much more visibility and involvement of transgender community within the framework of a mainstream LGBT human rights organization. And I think it reached that certain level that transgender people became actually visible in the public sphere. And just to give you an example, in 2015, we implemented the transgender visibility campaign where we were shooting videos where trans people uh, would simply talk about what does it mean to be a trans person in Lithuania? And uh, when we started this campaign, we had this imagination that like, oh my God, no, not any single trans person would be daring enough to stand in front of camera to share very personal things. And I have to say that we were very wrong. We, we found three very brave people who, who, who shared their stories. And it was very surprising to see, it was very surprising to see how viral the videos got. So, for example, when we launched them on YouTube on the very first day, it had more than 30,000 views on YouTube. And for a country like Lithuania, this is an incredibly big number. Uh, the videos were also like broadcasted like even on the news channels and stuff like that. So it was very something, uh, very something big because it was very new and unseen before. Um, 
also talking about the public representation of trans identities, we have to realize that this country is a very conservative and even, I would say, very hostile towards LGBT identities in general. And if you come, if you would ask me, is it, uh, is it easier to portray gay identity in the public sphere than trans identity? I would say it's vice versa. For trans people, it's a bit more easy to be more easily accepted. But then there's also a very big challenge in that, because I think I generally believe that trans people are accepted more easily because their identities are medicalized. So basically, to, to put it in a very simple language, it's like when people see a trans person, that they, the first thing they think that this is a per, this is a very unfortunate person because that person is ill in a way. So that generates better social acceptance, but on a very problematic grounds. Uh, so that was a negative side. Then on the positive side, I think in Lithuania is having uh, a lot of things to achieve in terms of LGBT equality in general. I think we have achieved a very important thing that we managed to include trans identities into the scope of this work from the very beginning. Because in, in more in the Western cultures, it was more gays and then trans identities came in later as a, like, as a valid uh, platform for uh, activism as well. So I think we managed not to repeat this mistake. And I think now all identities are being equally represented, which is, I think, is a very good thing to be proud of. Great, thank you. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna move to asking you about uh, language. Um, and if you could talk about the ways in which your, uh, the linguistic context in which your operating relates uh, to transgender. So I'm thinking, for instance, about the question of terminology, right? This is uh, terms that are used, um, discursive representation of trans. So I'd be interested in knowing to what extent language and discourse around transgender uh, relates uh, to your specific language and to what extent other languages, obviously I'm thinking mostly about English, but maybe German or maybe even another language, uh, Russian perhaps, um, constructs sort of the linguistic descriptions of trans bodies, trans lives, and, uh, and trans questions. So Matt, can we start with uh, you and French? Okay, so the first issue with French is that it's a gendered language. Yes. So, not um, in English you have the pronoun issue, but in French it's not only pronouns, it's every adjective. So basically every time you say something about yourself, you also mention your gender. You can't say I'm, I'm old without um, telling that you're old and a man or a woman. So, and the second problem with that from a feminist perspective is that when uh, there's a given group of individuals, the masculine wins so basically if you have 10 people uh, it won't it's they will always be assigned if as long as there's one male individual amongst the, among them they will always be assigned as uh, 10 males so um feminists have been working on that to create uh, something they call sometimes uh, inclusive language sometimes epicene language which come from a scientific term uh, meaning gender neutral or a non-sexist language, because uh, French language is inherently, in a way, sexist. So, uh, for instance, some of the solutions that people have come up with is to um, always, in any case, add the feminine mark to any adjective with a um, hyphen between the two. So this is quite a simple solution, but it's very um, little known. I know. And since, I think since, again, since last year, it is grammatically correct to um, feminize the group of people when there's still, when there are some men in the group, but uh, I don't think anybody knows the rule. Still, it's, it's, it's a win. And um, then there's the issue of pronouns, gender neutral pronouns. So some people are trying to come up with them. I don't see it uh, happening really, because the plural option that the, they, the English they wouldn't work at all and wouldn't make sense. And anyway, so some people have um, initiatives, for instance, spelling uh, the old pronouns differently, adding a letter or changing one. But as far as I can see, 
these us um, those initiatives are um, very limited, so they are not known uh, by a great public, not not at all, and there are a few of them, so they are even um, in, in concurrence with one another. And I think the idea of gentle natural pronoun to the, the French public in general is still um, highly um, impossible to understand. And um, the other thing is that most of the words, the, most of the terminology we use to designate ourselves as, you know, transgender, uh, trans, comes from the American background. So there are some um, cases of mistranslations which can be productive as well, but it's something like a um, colonized situation. We inherit or we take over the language of the dominance culture, um, which can be empowering, that, that's, that's not the point. And then as far as terminology goes, I think most people still don't understand the difference between um, transgender and transsexual. And, um, but it's, probably also the same thing in the US, I don't know. And then um, as far as uh, non-binaries, um, gender neutral, etc., that's not um, that's not something that's uh, discussed in French contemporary culture, or by a very, very small amount of people. Great. But Thank you, uh, can I ask you a follow-up question? Because I know uh, I know that you you teach French in the United States, right? So you have this kind of intercultural um, pedagogical thing. What do you do when you have uh, an American trans student in your French classroom who prefers to use they pronouns? How do you how do you deal with that in French? Uh, so that's never happened. I asked the pronouns question, but uh, <laughs> until then, my son always said preferred pronouns and then but very often students ask ask the question anyway and I'm um, tell them that there's there's no solution and if um, I mean if the case would come up would come up I, I think I'd figure out a solution that would be you know based on um, this group only and have something working but um, no <laughs> the problem never occurred. Yes, I, I have the same problem in my own teaching. Uh, Tomasz, can we go to, uh, to the German language? Yeah, sure. Um, so in, in German, we face the same problem which Matt described. So the language is also totally binary gendered. So we have a female and a male form for teacher and all professions or whatever. So um, yeah, you, you get immediately gendered and there's like, People for um, whom this doesn't fit in German seek um, yeah alternatives, but to me German is not such a creative or diverse language. I have to say, <laughs> so and for many other people neither. So um, the English term like it's not only like the Anglo-American context of transgender and transsexual used, um, but it's also like they from some German-speaking people speaking in German. Um, so use the pronoun they or them to themselves because the German language doesn't offer so much. There also tries to there tries to mix the male and the female pronoun, um, resulting in sier, which is like sie and er. And then like there are different like alternatives, but these are some. And another one is the like pronoun sia, which is like uh, x and IR, which um, yeah should also bring the two together or have an in-between form. They're um, yeah not so practically usable in many contexts, or they are like denied often also. Um, so in trans communities, this this pronouns are used, but I would say in the mainstream totally not. What changed in a certain uh, in the German language are two things. So we had the male and a female form and before like um, so they would to address also females in the room so they they put in the female form and now there's like an underscore between the male and the female form 
And the underscoring was like um, created actually almost 10 years ago, like to address this gap between the genders, like for people who are trans, who are intersex, who are non-binary. So this underscore is now slowly more widely populated. And there is another usage, um, which also the German state government apparently really likes. It's the asterisk. So I don't know if, if you use this in the States. So now often when there are like date brochures or report, it's like trans with asterisk. And this asterisk is used for like to not create this binary between transgender and transsexuals and non-binary people and in-betweens and furthermore, so to have an umbrella. Um, it's from this um, research, like from library research to use the asterisk. Um, I personally don't like it so much, I have to say, because it's for me also weird infantilization um, to have this like star everywhere. Um, but so there are tries in creating more space for people who are in between. But I think what also this thing with the not existing pronouns in between show that like the German society is clearly binary gendered. So for example, this there's a, like a huge movement now, which I, I, I'm pretty sure exists also in the US, which like is this genderqueer non-binary movement. And it's also connected, this is the interesting point also to like political and legal um, reform changes to try to enable a third gender, a third legal gender, or to abolish the um, gender registration birth certificates totally which um, I think will unfortunately not happen, but I think so there are tries to connect the language um, which started to be more diverse and was also like, um, or is more and more used also in state publications with underscore or asterisk, um, also on a, on a more social representative level. So you can see how discourse and language interacts definitely with like identity with um, representations, but also with societal change. Great, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, and Thomas, uh, Lithuanian. So Lithuanian language, the most important language in the universe, spoken by three million people, <laughs> <laughs> having, nothing, having nothing to do with any of the major linguistic groups, having, used, uh, having a linguistic group of its own. Um, having the insights, yes, we are very gender natural language and we gender not only the nouns, but we also gender the adjectives. So it makes it extremely difficult to even use the language in a way that it would not be gender. Uh, having in terms uh, to discuss the influence of other big languages around us, so it's called, of course the influence in our, in our regard comes both from Russian and both uh, from English. But then uh, we have a general, very interesting um, phenomenon that there is a very clear divide uh, in the society regarding the, the second language that people use. So people who are older than 35, they speak fluent Russian, but no English. And then people who are up to 35, uh, they speak uh, mm -hmm. only English and no Russian. Um, as a transgender human rights representation and trans identities representation in the public discourse is quite a new phenomenon. Luckily enough, it's much more heavily influenced by the use of the English language by, than by the use of the Russian language. And of course, young people who understand and who can consume information and entertainment in English, they get these ideas of the vocabulary that we use. And of course, the influences come from English literature, English series, from the shows like Drag Race, which is surprisingly very, very popular here. And of course, it's not about trans identities, but it's about uh, questioning the gender, narrative, the gender binary. Uh, but what is the most interesting aspect with the Lithuanian language for me is that we don't have a separate words for sex and gender. And it really shows what kind of mindset, mindset the language has, because the only word that we have in Lithuanian is refers to biological sex. And then uh, we chose the way to go around the gender, as we call it, uh, oh God, it's, it's going to sound very stupid, but we call it social sex. 
So in terms of even constructing the main concepts, we, so we face certain challenges. And of course, in explaining to people who are not very well familiar with the topic, it's, it's a big, big challenge. So on a way, the assistance from other languages, such as English, helps a lot. But also using the terms which are very clearly derived from a foreign language also reduces the ownership of the things or certain concepts. So we usually try to come up with our terms, which would be respectful, which would be inclusive. But as I said, sometimes it represents a significant challenge. Excellent. Thank you. Very, uh, also very interesting. So I want to pivot to asking you about the EU um, and or about Europe, in quotation marks. So the, the transnational European, in a, in a European sense. Um, so could you take what you've been talking about, and Thomas, you've already talked about this a little bit with respect to human rights in Europe, um, but how does the EU or how does Europe uh, relate uh, to trans questions with respect to the national context that you're familiar with? So we're interested both in the EU sort of as an institution, uh, but also questions of European transnationalism uh, more broadly. Um, and this might relate to um, you know, what we've been talking about with respect to representation and language, but it might also relate to questions of uh, dissemination of hormones, sexual reassignment surgery, or other, um, other questions related to uh, the medical context or also to, uh, to the legal context. So Matt, do you want to start? Okay. Um, so I think um, it's uh, it's like what um, Thomas said. The European Court of Justice is a big source of hope, and has been um, helping a lot uh, in the case of uh, gay and trans rights. And it's always, I mean, there was uh, lots of cases about um, adoption by same-sex people, for instance, that were taken to the European Court of Justice. And basically, when you take a case there, you are almost certain to, to win because um, I'm sure the France has a reputation as, uh, you know, a uh, country of uh, human rights, but uh, they are in, in um, as far as uh, gay and trans uh, and transgender rights are, are concerned, we are way below the European norms and we are not at all at the um, not at all respecting what the, the uh, EU is demanding in terms of um, punishing transphobia or in terms of, you know, punishing any discriminations, um, equality, etc. So, and we are, as opposed to Lithuania, we are not under a lot of pressure to <laughs> settle things. But still, um, I think mostly um, trans and queer people think about the EU as something as a possible solution for problems and as a sign that things can get better. And then the opposition, so people who opposed gay marriage and people who oppose uh, trans rights, so um, let's say a more conservative part of the population, sees the EU and EU, the institutions as something imposing foreign stuff on their identity. And in this case, it's very um, it's a paradox because they see the EU as Americanized. Uh, French people tend to see um, Germans, for instance, as agent from the US who are trying to modify their identity. And I'm sure Germans see it the exact same way. So it's I think it's just a conservative trend that has been um, mostly growing in France, and it has been very strong um, when gay marriage was uh, at the front scene. So um, since the EUs are so progressive in terms of trans rights, it's also all the more reason for the conservative to oppose the EU, and so what happened with Brexit. Then, and that's also, I also find it interesting because my research um, deals with uh, Europe at the beginning of the century and cultural exchange in Europe predates the EU and don't have anything to do with um, the US. And there were a lot of exchanges in terms of uh, trans rights and trans um, um, medical procedure at the beginning of the century, right after uh, World War One, in particular with the work of Magnus Hirschfeld in Germany that was 
very well known in France and generally speaking, um, there were a lot of exchanges between uh, particularly Paris and Berlin, much more than people would think. And also in terms of languages, much more people would um, speak German or French than one would imagine now. And there were lots of exchanges. For instance, the, the German cases were publicized in France. So there were uh, people traveling from France to Germany to um, try to get help and to try to get the first um, sex reassignments procedures. So I see a European tradition in terms of um, exchanges of knowledge, exchanges of um, uh, discussions uh, about gay rights and I think this, I mean, I hope that this discussion could be um, pursued because uh, this would also offer an alternative of um, to something we, we discussed, like the, the need to reappropriate uh, American culture and languages and to make it our own. And if there's, and there is really a trans culture uh, in Europe that predates uh, any American in intervention, because really the, the, the medical knowledge came from Europe and was imported to the US um, when um, German scientists had to flee Nazi Germany. Um, and I think um, actually this discussion about um, trans, gay, non-binary rights belongs to a certain older European culture. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Tomasz, uh, Germany and Europe. Yeah, I think it's like an interesting question, like the relation, um, Thomas also like referred to it before, like the relation of the nation states and the EU, because um, I would also say like there's a lot of potential in the like discussions on trans and general like LGBTIQ stuff and also um, anti-discrimination laws against racism, et cetera, in the European Parliament and the European Court of Justice. So there's a lot of, um, yeah, empowering, affirmative um, discussions going on now, which clearly state that trans people need to be recognized, um, that sterilizations are human rights violations, that people, trans youth has to be integrated in school, that there needs to be a medical um, health care for trans people. So there's a lot going on in the last years and it's also um, due to that like transgender Europe um, lobbied a lot and some other European transgender um, organizations which are also partially funded by uh, EU bodies so that um, I think the, the law changes really benefited from like um, what's got like the, like let's say a broader European perspective of activism, but also politicians getting more awareness and uh, law changes in Malta and Norway and Denmark. So Malta was in Europe, the, like the, yeah, the, groundbreaking moment after Argentina that it's possible um, and that the um, EU has a major part in it, like the discussions going on there. But nevertheless, like um, the, the EU has very limited possibilities of binding um, regulations. So mostly what they do is do regulations and um, at their do recommendations and they have um, in the field of human rights violation, if it doesn't go until like the European Court of Justice, very t limited um, possibilities to sanction because mostly often it's about money. In this case, I would say also, so as long as member states don't heavily have to pay um, the power of like the European Parliament or the European Union as such, is very limited and I would also say like one part of the EU is human rights but a major big part as we also saw um, with Brexit and with the whole crisis um, with Greece and Portugal that its economy is so um, there are just two strands and mostly money goes first so also in this case I would say it's an economic union and it's a human rights union but um, I would agree to the point that um, there are some, some discussions in the European Parliament and recent changes are very progressive, 
and also the backlash right now against the EU, um, like rising not only Brexit, but we face nationalist um, governments, maybe also in France and also um, in Germany, like a nationalist party entered several regional governments and will eventually also get in now with the new elections. So I think we, um, we have both. Um, on one on one side, um, a EU which advances the human rights and has possibilities, and I think also pushes the discourse like that. Um, because in Germany until 2011, the sterilization was also forced, and until then, the whole discourse was abolishing sterilization. And now the discourse is also like to enable legal change of name and gender marker without pathologization, to enable school inclusion job market, all this stuff which before didn't exist. So I think it is an important um, institution, um, but it's always in constant battle with a nation state. And yeah, we still have nation states with their own interests, with their own agendas, and um, also with certain political situation in which certain governments, and this is what I meant with the law change in Germany, which hopefully is going to happen regarding the transsexual law, but this is always connected to election, to election outcomes. So, um, yeah, we see um, how this, yeah, the EU and the nation states constantly struggle also. Great, thank you. Yeah, a lot of crossover between France and Germany. Uh, Thomas, what about uh, Lithuania and the EU? Um, so when we talk about Europe and transgender and human rights, we have to have two separate institutions in mind. So first of all, it's the European Union, which is foremost the economical union. And then we have to talk about Council of Europe, which is first and foremost the human rights union. So when we talk about the European Union, it was clearly pointed out, it has certain aspects of trans human rights inclusion but it's very limited in its capacity to enforce it upon its member states. So just to give you, for example, uh, like uh, the principle of non-discrimination in the field of employment is one of the key principles of the European Union. So for example, in 19, one, uh, 90, uh, like 10 years ago, uh, the European Court of Justice, which is the European Union Court, uh, made this judgment that discrimination of a person who is going through a gender reassignment procedure is the same as the discrimination based on gender and is prohibited within the EU law. And basically, this is the highest level of protection which you, at the moment, can offer for transgender people. So that's for the European Union. When we start talking about the Council of Europe, Council of Europe has been an absolute standard setter for the transgender human rights in the broader context of Europe. Because the Council of Europe has more member states than the European Union, because in the European Union you have 28 member states, in the Council of Europe you have 49 member states. And for example, the European Court of Human Rights is the court of the Council of Europe. And it was very rightfully pointed out by my colleagues, the European Court of Human Rights really, really helped to promote the transgender human rights on pan-European level. Uh, it's very important to note that in 2015, in April 2015, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe adopted the resolution specifically targeting transgender human rights. And that, um, that resolution is based on the best practice example from Malta. And it says an absolute standard, the best practice example, whenever it's possible at the moment, for all the European countries to follow. Of course, the problem with the resolution by the Parliamentary Assembly is that it's not legally binding. It's just simple as a recommendation, as the highest standard, which the member states should be striving in achieving. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, the resolutions by the Parliamentary Assembly usually very well informs the judgments by the European Court of Human Rights, and the judgments by the European Court of Human Rights are mandatory not only upon the state which the judgment is rendered against, but also to all the member states of the Council of Europe. And it's very interesting to note, for example, now there are three cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights. All of those cases are against France. And the thing, the subject matter which is being questioned in, uh, in those cases is, is it legal to require for gender assignment surgery before obtaining legal gender recognition? 
And now I think the biggest tragedy in this, that it would have been very successful claim in my personal opinion. The problem is now that France has changed his, uh, its uh, legislation on legal gender reassignment in a more positive way. So what the thing the court is going to usually say in this kind of circumstances is that, yeah, it, it was a violation of human rights before, but now as it's being amended and fixed and improved, there is no need for us to say that France should do it. Uh, so I think, uh, to conclude with, I think the Council of Europe is the forum in the in Europe, in inverted commas, where we should seek for further options of improving transgender human rights. And as, for example, as it's demonstrated by my own case, usually the judgments or opinions or documents or legal texts by the Council of Europe are usually very effective in promoting transgender human rights at the national level as well. Great. Thank you very much. I want to give our uh, colleagues at Illinois or Florida or in the room here a uh, chance to ask any questions that anyone uh, would like to ask our three guests. Anyone in Florida? Florida. <laughs> yeah. Here with it. Anybody in the room here that'd like to ask a question? Lisa, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Tomas, especially, um, but maybe also some of the other speakers, could you talk about um, the way that specifically conservative political movements, like in Poland, for example, have really used pushback against pressure from Europe to adopt Western standards and um, especially in Catholic countries, there's been this uh, very weird kind of conservative pushback to uh, lesbian and gay movements. And also I'm curious about trans movements and the way kind of those internal politics work, especially with the church and the state. Um, thank you very much. It's a very, very good question, but I my, um, the only problem is regarding this question and my national context is that the Baltic states are in a very peculiar geopolitical situation. So we are very close to Russia and we are very afraid of Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so when answering this question, I will make a reference to the popular joke, which is a bit racist, but it's true that what we have here is the joke sounds like this. Uh, the only thing that Lithuanians hate more than gays are Russians. <laughs> so, so actually, like we had this discourse of uh, LGBT human rights being imported from the West in the past, yeah. but it was very surprising and interesting to see that, for example, when the situation with Crimea happened, and also when the situation with the eastern part of Ukraine started evolving, we immediately dropped this discourse that anything is being imported from the West. The only thing that we want now, we want to be in the West, and if even requires sacrificing certain other socially conservative values, we are fine with this. But again, once again, this is applicable, I think, only to the national context of the Baltic states. So, oh, the yeah. and Estonia. when you ask about Poland, you have to have in mind that Poland is a country of 40 million people. And in Europe, that's, uh, and in Europe, that's something which is uh, significant. And that cannot be ignored. So I think the, the political development which are happening in Poland right now, they are more um, um, challenging because Poland is geopolitically much more important country. And unfortunately, I cannot speak for the Polish context because I'm not very well aware of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Thank Tomasz, you. do you have any, any thoughts on the, on the Polish uh, question? No, unfortunately not. I think You're like the Germany part, right? between like uh, Germany and Poland is very different, and I I'm also like with um, conservative religion or like Catholic. Poland is pretty Catholic um, countries and anti-feminism because it's not only anti-gay and anti-trans stuff. It's anti-abortion. It's like many things coming together. Um, I think. Yeah, the, the, the situation is too different that I could speak about. I would nevertheless say in Germany, which is 
yeah, also maybe not super liberal. It's like always to what in, in comparison to what the question, but um, uh, what Tomas also said that sometimes um, the society or also politics um, unites against a bigger evil. And I think this discourse also changed with, like after 2001 and the terror attacks and recent attacks in Europe. So that I have the feeling there's more um, acceptance of LGBTIQ people than um, yeah in the aspect of racism, racial profiling. So um, I think in this case we also have to consider sometimes like. Um, yeah, the aspect of homonationalism also exists in Germany. Great. Uh, Matt, do you have an answer to your question? It's an answer, yes. Yeah. It's a non-answer that is Thank an answer. <laughs> um, can, I, can I ask you a little, to talk a little, the three of you, to talk a little bit more about intersectionality? Um, so I'd be interested in your thoughts about um, trans men, trans women, non-binary gender identities, and if there are differences with respect to what we've been talking about in those categories. Uh, but also, um, a couple of you have already talked about race, immigration, migration, trans people of color. Um, could, could you sort of talk about what intersectionality with respect to, to gender, race, ethnicity sort of does to, uh, to what we've been talking about? Matt, do you wanna, do you wanna start Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously about non-binary gender identities, um, it's I think very difficult to live in France and almost impossible to li live in France under a non-binary gender identity and you know find a, find a job and be respected in that matter. And then um, I think uh, the difference in situation for trans men and trans women are the fact that. Trans is a mostly misogynist society, so women, trans or not, have it more difficult than, than men. Um, and but I think the the, the intersectionality question is is even more important because uh, so that's the question of race that complicates everything. Because let's say if you that it's a continuum, right? If you are a um, trans uh, woman of color you're in a much more fragile situation than if you are a trans white man, particularly if you pass as men. And um, there's also, uh, the, the, the situation is also more difficult for trans women because people confuse uh, transsexuality, transgenderism, and transvestism, and sex work. So whether you're a sex worker or not, that raises some issues and some also all sort of homosexual panic and violence. Uh, then again, if you are a trans, a trans worker, um, male or female, there are also um, huge issues because uh, trans workers aren't protected at all in France. So you are against the law. And so if you are unprotected by the law uh, in your job, professional activity, and if you're also unprotected by the law in terms of your ID, um, ID papers, like uh, your gender doesn't match, and then you're in a very, very difficult situation. There are medical issues as well, and there are um, people doing a great job to have se sex workers, but there are also lots of uh, intolerance, and um, particularly, unfortunately, from a feminist perspective, so um, if you are a um, sex worker and or a person that's without any, um, without French citizenship, and if your visa status isn't um, what it's uh, supposed to be, and it can't be what it's supposed to be if you're a sex worker because your employer technically doesn't exist, then again, you're also in a very, very difficult and fragile situation. And this isn't going any better because, um, like I said, uh, feminists are opposing um, anything. Uh, the, a large mainstream brand of French feminism is is opposing um, is opposing um, any kind of rights for sex workers, and also um, 
in France as in the US right now, uh, the situation for immigrants is really bad and racism isn't, uh, is racist. I don't know if racism itself is growing, but what's certain is that people acting on it and particularly police force acting on it, as we saw in the last case of uh, um, a black guy who has been basically raped by the police and there's not even, um, not much legal consequences of the person who did it. And so this context is very violent and um, makes uh, trans people um, life particularly difficult if they are uh, people of color, if they are um, immigrants or sex workers. Great, thank you. Uh, Tamash, do you have, do you have thoughts on uh... German intersectionality. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think there's like, first starting with trans male and trans female. Um, it's, I would say, because I have been traveling and also been at different places, for me it's really interesting that in Germany I would say it's like um, a huge invisibility of trans feminine people and more of trans feminine people of color. So a lot of organizing, um, community organizing, also like um, trans studies, it's majorly white, trans, masculine, and also non-binary people. So I would say um, in the general mainstream, non-binary people um, definitely struggle a lot. Um, I, I'm not sure if more or less, because this is, depends on so many other things, and it is on the intersection also. So not only being non-binary, but being black, white, disabled, um, whatever um, economic backgrounds are also there. So um, I would say for me, it's or it was really interesting to be in context where in the forefront of trans activism were more like trans women of color and trans sex workers, which is a very different activism than the one I was used to. Um, which is more like, uh, I would say, educated, like academic um, activism of where white trans males are more present. And I would also say that, um, yeah, the aspect what I mentioned before, like racial profiling exists also in Germany. Um, and it is as, at the cross where like uh, intersections of gender and race always. So I know many people who um, were checked because of accusations of identity frauds at national borders or like um, random police searches. And this mostly happens to people of color and black people. So um, the like the part of racism is very strong and also it changed again like after the so-called refugee crisis in summer 2015. Um, afterwards, like, so, or almost all EU member states closed their national borders and their, like, um, like checkpoints, you can say, again, um, which before didn't exist. So many trans people now suffer more from, like, ID checks and, like, discrimination when, like, um, yeah, the officers decide that the ID um, picture or name doesn't match their appearance. And I would also say there's like more like visibility now also because they're like, I work in an organization which also um, does counseling for trans refugees. And in the beginning when people came, because it was interesting for me because I wrote in my dissertation that um, refugees until they're like, um, yeah, acknowledged refugees have refugee status and permanent um, legal rights to stay in Germany. They cannot access the law, like the transsexual law, and they cannot access the trans health care. So at one point they have to prove that they're trans, but they're denied also the means if they want to have this means to do so. And this situation changed with like, um, yeah, more um, trans refugees, people of color also stepping in the forefront and also arguing with politicians that um, people need protection in asylum shelters um, in this process because like it's multiple discriminations and um, so there's like m more I think also when we talked about the um, level of representation before before I would say it was pretty wide streamed slowly the picture gets more diverse that 
Um, yeah, also you can see sometimes in a publication uh, a trans person of color or a trans person with disabilities. So there is stuff coming up, but I would say there is still um, yeah a lot to do. And also the like this is what I started actually to do in my dissertation, in which I face now also in co like in in counseling people or like a young trans person with uh, mental disabilities. Like, um, you cannot get a place in shelter for them. Um, like, the law, like, to get, um, like, wanted hormone replacement um, treatment is super difficult. Um, so, like, I have the feeling slowly and awareness and research is starting what actually happens at the so-called intersections where, like, which was before super marginalized. And also more activism is coming up. But I said in the recent years, there's more black and of color, trans and non-binary activism. There was a um, last year a trans film festival, which was actually only organized by trans people of color and black activists and mostly also migrants. It's also interesting. So that also some activist parts are very influenced also by the fact that Berlin is like a metropole from which different people also come from different countries because it offers different possibilities. So, and then a suburb in Germany or in another European country. So um, I think there's still a lot to do and also concerning trans studies. I have the feeling like slowly it's starting in Germany to have trans studies a bit more intersectional, but there is still a lot to be done. Great, thank you. Uh, and last question, Thomas, Lithuanian intersectionality. So unfortunately, I cannot comment more on intersectionality between gender identity and race because this country is so wide that it even sometimes hurt my eyes. But I think, <laughs> but I think it's very important to comprehend this, this very difficult and sometimes uh, socially pressing aspect of, of our work. And it was very surprising to me to discover actually very recently how much more underprivileged trans women are in this country than trans men. And just to give you a very concrete example, last year I was, I was doing a research on the situation of transgender persons in employment. And I was interviewing trans people about, about their experiences, how do they feel at work. And the only requirements of participating in this study was uh, transgender identity and uh, experience uh, in the field of employment. So a person was holding a position, either legally or non-legally, doesn't matter. And then all trans women that I identified in the study, all of them at that given moment were out of work. And it was incredible to realize, because this is something you would not ever think about, especially coming from the context where trans rights in general are very challenging, but then you very clearly and you see very in a very clearly defined way that certain social attitudes towards women in general, of course, affect those people in a very unexpected circumstance. So I think uh, we cannot dissociate uh, gender identity from other vulnerable characteristics as well. We also have to be very aware of the fact that in many, many countries, uh, transgender identity is being considered as a mental disorder. And based on that diagnosis, people are denied of many, many opportunities. Like, you know, now Russia is even considering the law that they would deny driving license to people who have a mental diagnosis, including transgender people, which is absolutely ridiculous, no? But it's very interesting to see because intersectionality has to be promoted as concept in advancing the human rights of various vulnerable groups. Again, example, uh, when I was addressing the person who is leading an umbrella organization for people with disabilities about any ideas of including also certain aspects of transhuman rights within the framework of the work, as this identity is still pathologized in this country and it could result in certain limitations in practice. Oh, that person was very, very surprised because it was very hard for them to comprehend that uh, certain aspects affecting transgender uh, identities could be part of their work. So I think this is a very important uh, question. It requires further discussion, especially in the context where other aspects come into play, such as race. So I, I think very, very good, uh, good thing to talk about.
Great, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to add something um, because this for me is also a connection to the discussion we had before in law reform. I think um, con concerning um, like, yeah, trans people of color, trans people with disabilities or very young trans people, um, I think we can still see that um, law reform is very important, but that they are very like people live very precarious lives, and that law reform isn't also enough. So I think it's it's very important to see this um, because first of all, there's a definition, the distinction between de facto and the jure, like law practice, but also um, for many people, certain laws they don't affect their lives. If it like. If like a refugee um, who's um, yeah not getting state benefits and does state uh, sex work, which in Germany is luckily legal, but their living situation doesn't have to be affected at all by, for example, law change. If refugees are not included in this law change, and I think this is something we always have to keep in mind that um, trans lives and especially in the intersections are very precarious still. And also the aspect of misogyny is definitely also there in Germany. And um, what I've mentioned with like um, activism of people of color and trans pe uh, black trans people is also um, showing that a lot of empowering is coming from a community, not from a state legal or medical level. So a lot of this organizing is not state or NGO funded. And to see this that um, Unfortunately, this, there's a lot of necessity for this because there is not so much empowerment on other levels still. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we're out of time. I could easily spend the rest of the day listening to the three of you talk. It's been extremely interesting for me and I think for everyone else uh, in the room. So on behalf of the European Studies Center, the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Program here at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, I'd like to thank the three of you, Matt, uh, Thomas, and Tomasz, uh, for spending your uh, this part of your afternoon or your evening, depending on where you're located, um, with us. So thank you very, very much for your uh, for your time and for uh, participating. And thanks to you, Todd, and to our partners at the University of Illinois European Union Center, um, and to uh, the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at Florida International. Uh, thank you all, and um, our next Conversation on Europe will be Tuesday, March 21st, on the Dutch elections and whether they're a bellwether for what's going to happen with the rest of Europe, a Frexit, a Nexit, what's, what's going to happen next. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> stay tuned for that and look for the recording of this show, um, of this session on YouTube. Thank you all. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.